a tremendous turnout and uh, those of us uh, part of the prostate cancer mission are so grateful uh, that all of you are here. My name is Michael Putney and it is my pleasure to uh, be the moderator of the session this morning. This is a conversation that I think in our community is long overdue. This open conversation about prostate cancer. One important reason for me about why I am part of the prostate cancer mission and why I am here this morning is I had prostate cancer nine years ago. <clears throat> and thanks to some excellent physicians, a loving and supporting family, and perhaps even some answered prayers, um, I am alive and well and thriving. But I'm here in large part on the board of the Camp Prostate Cancer Mission because thousands of men in our community and millions of men in the world uh, will not have the same success that I did. They will not be diagnosed in time. They will not be cured. And their families, as a result, will suffer as they suffer from the disease which will take their lives. And I think that only goes to underscore the message on the logo, if you will notice, of the prostate cancer mission. It says, no man should die of prostate cancer. Amen. We all believe that. And we are here with that in mind to discuss the scientific and the human aspects of this disease. And we have an outstanding panel of uh, uh, people to talk about it and we have an outstanding audience. So many of you are here from the business, civic, medical communities. Uh, you bring so much knowledge and in the course of the discussion uh, you will have questions and you will find that on your chairs there are uh, notepads and pencils or pens and if you have a question for one of the panelists I would urge you to uh, write it down. Those questions will be collected and then uh, Dr. Krongrad is going to go through and we will select as many as possible to pose to the panelists. Um, I'm also glad to see so many business leaders here this morning because as you well know beyond the human cost uh, of this disease there is a huge financial cost. I see managing partners of law firms uh, here this morning and uh, you certainly know that when lawyers who are critical to your success for example uh, are diagnosed and perhaps diagnosed late with prostate cancer you lose uh, their skills, their, uh, their abilities and also you may lose them as friends. So this cuts across the whole spectrum and I'm glad that the spectrum is represented. Well there are, there's a lot to talk about this morning and it's going to be good, frank, open talk. And we are going to begin with one of the renowned experts on this in the world. He has flown here from Lyon, France, which he told me when I said, well gee, you can get a really good meal there and he said, uh, yes, but it's a little bit small, 500,000 people as opposed to Milan where he used to uh, live and work. Uh, when you hear him speak, you will understand he's from neither Lyon or Milan. He is from Scotland uh, and he's got a great Scottish accent. Uh, Dr. Peter Boyle is the director of the International Agency for Research on Cancer. He has many uh, real and honorary uh, uh, awards and titles. He is an honorary professor of cancer prevention and control at Oxford University, honorary professor of cancer epidemi epidemiology at Birmingham University, and a visiting professor at Glasgow University. So let's begin. If you would please welcome Dr. Peter Boyle. Mr. Chairman, it's a great pleasure to be here. I would really like to congratulate my good friend Arne and Krongrad in getting together this initiative and working to increase 
the visibility locally, nationally, and hopefully globally about prostate cancer. There's two unique things about this meeting, for me anyway. One is the, the lack of sponsorship from anyone, if you look at the sponsors on the back page, there is no medical device maker, pharmaceutical industry, there's no external support and I'm delighted that this is, this is the case because it allows us to do things without any external pressure going in that direction. And the second thing is that for the first time in my life, someone come up to me, Armin come up to me just about 10 minutes ago and said, Peter, could you speak for 30 minutes instead of 15? Everyone wants to cut down, so he's asked me to speak a bit longer than usual. So I hope I don't bore you. <coughs> I've got a talk which is divided into two parts. The first part, I just want to let you know that there's a huge change in the distribution of cancer of all forms around the world and we're in the middle of the, well actually in the middle of the development of a huge epidemic of cancer cases around the world of all types. I also want to show you that prostate cancer is a particular problem, it's a particular growing problem, not only in Florida and the United States, but this is going to be one of the major problems worldwide and I'm 100% convinced that the motto of this, that men shouldn't die of prostate cancer, is certainly Okay. It's certainly something that we can all sign up to and we should all work actively to do something about. The current situation worldwide is that we've got this year, this is ignoring all the little skin cancers, we include melanoma but not the basal and squamous cell cancers, is that this year in the world there'll be 11 million people diagnosed with cancer for the first time. There'll be 7 million people who will die from cancer. Others will die with cancer, but that won't be the cause of death. And there's 25 million people alive and living with a diagnosis of cancer. A hundred years ago, primary carcinoma of the lung, lung cancer, was recognized to be one of the rarest tumor types that was ever seen. But today, one cancer in every eight diagnosed worldwide is a lung cancer. These are all man-made. 95% of lung cancer is caused by cigarette smoking. One cancer in 10 is a breast cancer, one in 11 is colorectal, one in 11 is stomach cancer. Prostate cancer is 6% of the global cancer burden and liver cancer is about 6% too. And these six forms of cancer account for half of all the global cancer burden. But you can see here that the if I can figure out which one is this. You look at the lung cancer in the top. I'm just looking for a point. I'm looking for a pointer. Lung cancer on the top. The orange are the number of cases. The green are the number of deaths. And lung cancer is by far the commonest cancer in, in men at the present time. But globally, all over the world, prostate cancer is now the second commonest form of cancer diagnosed in men. We reckon there was over 600,000 cases diagnosed when we did this compendium in 2002. We're in the process of doing it again and the number's going to rise to much closer to a million new cases of prostate cancer diagnosed around the world each year. In women, to give you just an idea, breast cancer is by far the commonest cause of cancer in women. There's 1.2 million cases of breast cancer in women every year. And something which is extremely rare in the United States and North America, cervix cancer is the second commonest form of cancer in women. And that's essentially a major problem in the low and medium resource countries. If you could just move this slide down a little bit, it's not, we've lost the title up here. It's just, we need, one of the interesting and important things about cancer is that Cancer shifting. The cancer 40 years ago, cancer was a disease where the huge majority was in the developed countries, in the Western industrialized countries. But here we look around the world, these are data from the African region of the World Health Organization. And the shock here is on, as you look at it, on the left hand side here, you see that Kaposi sarcoma is the commonest form of cancer in men in Africa. This is all related to the HIV AIDS epidemic there. 
But even in Africa, you can see that prostate cancer is the third commonest form of cancer in men in Africa. Cervix cancer in women dominates the pattern there. When we look at the Americas, North and South and North America, prostate cancer is the commonest form of cancer in men now. The burden of cancer in North America is dominated here by prostate cancer here at the top in terms of the number of cases. But thankfully, because of a lot of determined work by outstanding urologists and other scientists, the deaths from prostate cancer are much less. The case fatality is much less than, for example, for lung cancer, where there's not much difference between the number of cases diagnosed and the annual number of deaths. And even in Latin America and the Caribbean, prostate cancer is the commonest cancer in men. But here you can see that the ratio of numbers of cases to death is a little bit different. The case fatality is a little bit higher here. The situation in women is dominated by breast and cervix cancer. In, this is the Southeast Asian region. This is dominated by the pattern in India. You see prostate cancer is still relatively rare in that part of the world. In China, in the Middle East, these are the Arab countries here at the Eastern Mediterranean region. Again, you can see that prostate cancer is um, bladder cancer is the commonest cancer in men in the Middle East. There's not much mention of prostate down here at the very bottom. In the Western Pacific, this is dominated by China, where one fifth of the world's population live. Here you can see stomach, lung, liver are the dominant pattern in men with relatively few prostate cancers. Hmm? We don't know. We'd like to know. <laughs> We'd like if, if we all want to become Chinese and live in China, that might be something. <laughs> in the European region, that's from Greenland here out to Siberia, um, pattern in men is dominated by lung, but prostate cancer is now the second commonest form of cancer there. If we look at the, just the Eastern Europe, that's from Russia. Um, all the old Russian republics are way to the east. Here you can see stomach uh, prostate cancer is much rarer than it is in Western Europe. So it exists everywhere, but there's ge huge geographical variation in it. Now prostate cancer, all forms of cancer, as we know, the risk becomes greater with increasing age. This is not because aging is the risk factor. This is just because over time you accumulate the exposure to the relevant risk factors. And prostate cancer is particularly common, much, much more common um, in, in the aging, aging men. And one of the situations that we're starting to see develop is that we're living in a completely new era. We've gone through an experience that we've never seen before. According to the estimates, there's between 80 billion and 100 billion people ever lived on this planet. And the intriguing fact is that every, for those who've reached the age of 65, two-thirds of them are alive today. So we're in a completely new game. We've never experienced this before. It's a completely new situation for humanity where there's so many, such a large proportion of the population um, in, it's of seniors who are alive today. This is, we're living, I don't like the word geriatric, I don't think it means anything anymore, but we've got to be able to realise that we're living with a unique situation with an ageing population. You can see the impact of ageing. This is the population of the United States from 1950 in five year intervals up to 2050. These are zero, this is men and women. These are the number of people in each five year age group, zero to four, five to nine, up to 85 plus. When we go back to the situation in 1950, you can see it's a relatively young population, there's not so many elderly. What's happened is the population is growing outwards and it's growing upwards. There's more people and on average they're getting older. We know that, we know all about the greying of the United States population, but what we lose sight of is the fact when we look globally is that the same thing's happening in China. Now this is the population pyramid for China, it goes up to 100 plus, 
men and women. And it's the same as the United States from 1950 up until 2050. You can see when we go back to 1950, there's no elderly people in the population of China. But as the last century terminated, the population grew outwards, but it also grew upwards. And as you look ahead, we're going to see a distinct aging of the Chinese population. China, the population of China, is one-fifth of the world's population. And that's going to have a huge impact on the global cancer problem. And here's what's going to happen in China. This is the percentage of elderly. Now, my definition of elderly changes every year. I think it's about 90 just now, but this is the percentage of people over the age of 65 in China's population from 1950 to 2050. Here it's 5% up until about 1990. Suddenly, it's going to increase to a quarter. So we're going to go from 8% of the Chinese population aged over 65 today to 24% aged over 65 in, in 25 years' time. There's a rapid aging of the population of China, and this is something which is very typical of what's happening in what used to be the developing countries, the emerging countries. Because we see the same in India, we see the same in Indonesia, we see the same all over Asia and Central and South America. And this aging of the population is going to give us a huge problem for the global cancer burden. This is the population of the world in 2005, according to the United Nations. Six and a half billion people. And this is the age distribution from zero to four up to 85 plus. I'm going now to flick to the next slide. I couldn't get it to automate itself. Um, and we're going to look at 2030. This will be the increase in the population. But as I flick to the next slide, watch the growth outwards and the growth upwards here of the population. So you see what's going to happen to the world. Population is going to increase from 6.5 billion to 8.1 billion over the next 25 years, and it's going to be significantly older. The consequence is that we're going to go from this situation today to the situation we expect in 2030. The 11 million cases that we're going to have this year will increase to 27 million around the world. The number of deaths will increase from 7 million per annum to 17 million per annum, and there will be 75 million people alive with cancer. The reasons are this. It's going to, just to emphasize, this is something which is not just going to affect the developed countries. It's going to be a two and a half fold increase in Africa, in Pavo, particularly in Southern Latin and America and the Caribbean. It's going to be a huge increase in the numbers of cases of cancer each year. Um, the India, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, the Western Pacific, this is China and all the countries around there, and even in Europe. So it's going to be everywhere in the world. We're going to see tremendously rapid increases in the global cancer burden. That's cancer of all forms, and particular among that, there's going to be a huge increase in prostate cancer. All that overall for three reasons. The growth of the world's population, the aging of the world's population, and then one of the greatest business type successes of the last 40 years in terms of cancer is the successful exportation of cancer risk factors such as cigarette smoking from the high resource countries to the low resource countries who are absolutely building up an epidemic of tobacco related disease in those countries. We calculate this century, and this is something we've published with a great deal of comments. There's going to be one billion people in the world this, this century who will die because they smoke cigarettes. And all of that, all of that is completely avoidable. So here you see the era that we're in. These are the burden of cancer around the world. It doubled between 1975 and 2000, and now it looks as though it's going to rise exponentially. There's a huge problem with cancer worldwide. It's a global problem. But we can begin to cope with it if we put a big investment in logistics and training and infrastructure in our own communities. But the places which are going to be hardest hit by that, this are going to be those low-income and middle-income countries at the present time. And just to digress for two minutes, just to show you 
the problems that we're facing. We know that radiotherapy, when you look at cancer as a whole, radiotherapy is a key component, one of the basic components of cancer care. Half of patients in Western society get one course of radiotherapy and a quarter will have a, a second course of radiotherapy. The real drama today is that there's 30 countries in the world that don't have a single radiotherapy machine. There is huge, and there's, Africa has got 20% of its needs in radiotherapy. There's um, 5,000 radiotherapy machines short in the low resource countries. This means that there's a whole huge proportion of patients with cancer who are totally excluded from any form receiving any form of conventional therapy. Thankfully something's been done about this. The International Atomic Energy Agency, we're working with them. The 150 million people going to get cancer in low resource countries between 2000 and 2020, of which 100 million are suitable for radiotherapy, and yet we've only got radiotherapy to meet 20% of those needs. This is a shocking situation, but we're really working um, very closely with the other authorities and other United Nations agencies to try and rectify the present time. And while around the world we, we hear everything, we hear huge wonderful work and resources and financing and lobbying for tuberculosis, for AIDS and malaria, these are wonderful, these are focus points of the Millennium Development Goals, which is a wonderful, wonderful initiative. But we've forgotten that we haven't mentioned cancer at all in the Millennium Development Goals. We don't have a very organised international cancer control community, and yet we know that there's more deaths each year in the world from cancer than from TB, AIDS and malaria combined. So that's the global picture. We're in a unique situation which is in terms of the global cancer burden is going to get worse. There's going to be a huge increase in the numbers of cases of cancer which arise worldwide as we go forward over the next 10 or 20 years. This is not a theoretical exercise, this is going to happen because these people are already alive and in the process of ageing, their life expectancy is increasing and the demographics of the world, particularly low resource countries, are changing dramatically. So we go back here to the worldwide frequency of cancer in men, and here you can see prostate cancer is the second commonest form of cancer, like I pointed out to you earlier on. We underplay urology. When we look around the world, the proportion of urological cancers of all cancers in men, 30% today, 30% of all cancers worldwide, 30% are urological cancers. And this has risen from 20% in 1960. The reason for the increase here is bladder cancer going up from 1975, 80, 85, 90, 2000, 2002. Bladder cancer test is kidney, but the huge increase which has been taking place now for 30 years is in prostate cancer worldwide. And you can see that with that, and if that keeps on going, added on top of the growth and ageing of the population, we're going to reach a very dramatic situation. As we look around the world, there's every five years my agency produces this compendium of cancer incident statistics from all over the world. This is we're now at the ninth volume of cancer incidents in five continents, and we now cover about 300 different populations with cancer incidents around the world. And this are the 20 highest and the 20 lowest rates of prostate cancer all over the world. And this is a disconcerting message. This is the rates here going up to about 200 per 100,000 per annum. The highest rate in the world is among the black community in the United States, in Austria, Canada, New Zealand, the whites in the white community in the United States. Can Canadian registries up here, Australia, Switzerland. It's all high resource countries up here. The good news, the exciting news, and the news that we've got to develop a strategy to investigate why is that you can get places such as Korea, Mumbai, Hong Kong, Serbia, Singapore, Japan, Italy, Central Italy, Southern Italy, Ragusa and Syracuse, in um, um, Regione Sicilia in Southern Italy, um, Spain, Czech, Denmark. There are parts of the world where you can get very, very low incidence rates. 
We don't know why. But theoretically, we, if we got all these incidence rates here down to this level here, then we could eliminate about three quarters of all prostate cancer worldwide. That's a challenge. A challenge for epidemiology. We're not making much progress, but there's certainly something that we need to make a lot more effort to do to attack this problem on a global scale. There are some places in the world where we don't have um, really high quality, these are poorer quality um, cancer registration data, but when you start to look at places like Central Africa where there's incomplete data, huge rates in Zambia, huge rates in Zimbabwe, huge rates in Uganda, huge, very high incidence rates of prostate cancer in Central Africa and also in populations living in the Caribbean. There are some places that we don't have mortality uh, incidence data for and we're forced to look at mortality. And here you can see you know, Tajikistan, um, the various countries like Kuwait, Armenia, Japan down here, where you can achieve very low mortality rates because you've got very low incidence rates. And a lot of these countries like Norway, Sweden, Denmark, come from, these are areas where the mortality is very high and the incidence is very high too. The trends, what's going to, is the incidence rising, declining, what? There's a number of countries, we just look at a country level, there's a number of countries, there's very few of them, with a population based coverage of cancer incidence and cancer mortality for a long period of time. This allows us to see how things, how patterns are evolving. Norway, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Scotland, England and Wales, Slovenia, Slovakia, Singapore and the SEER areas, that's the 16% of the US population covered by cancer registry. These have existed for a while and we can look at trends. These are the trends, time trends from 1955 up into 2005 in the incidence of prostate cancer. You can see even in the low rates area here, like in Singapore, this is the SEER area of the United States, this is Sweden, you can see dramatic increases taking place in the incidence of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is becoming much more frequent very rapidly in a large number of western style populations around the world. The only good news we've got is that this is the mortality, this is the death rate from prostate cancer. You can see that it remained increased here a little bit but by and large now there's good signs here that the whole pattern is starting to beginning to come and turn down. That's great news, incidents going up, mortality coming down, we're catching the disease earlier, we're treating it better, the outcome for the individual man is better, that's great. But we've still got a long, long way to go. And of course the best thing that we can do is to stop people getting the disease in the first place. Because a very famous Scotsman wrote um, 200 years ago, um, prevention avoids the labour of being sick. When you look at other countries, like Australia, Austria, where we don't have incidence data, here's Japan down here, here's Greece down here. Again, when you look at the mortality, you can see, apart from a few low places, nice turnarounds and decline in the death rate from prostate cancer. I think that's a great success. If we can now get the incidence to come down, that will be an even greater success in decline, and make this decline come much more rapidly. I just want to show you um, how you can get things really wrong. This wasn't me. There was a, a, a publication in The Lancet about five years ago and it said these are the mortality from prostate cancer in the United Kingdom. This is mortality from prostate cancer in the United States. In the United States there's a tremendous amount of screening since 1990. In the United Kingdom there's no screening at all. There's a tremendous amount of um, very radical treatment in the United States, there's very little in Britain. And yet they, are, they argued that the mortality rates were both becoming, starting to become down, so therefore this had nothing at all, the decline in the United States had, had nothing to do with, treat, with, with diagnosis, early detection and radical therapy. They really should have waited a while because when you add on the year data from beyond 1999, you can see now the effect in the United States of this huge increase 
in the prevalence of screening and radical therapy. They stopped to publish their information about here when there was no difference. And it's really, it's really useful to wait to see what's going to happen in the long term because now you can see the dramatic gap between the situation in the United States and the United Kingdom. And of course, they got it all wrong because they were all... Oh! Could you... Excuse me, could you put that on again? I've got a... It's just disappeared off. You, you, you just be a good Samaritan. You see, we concentrated on this area here, but we didn't look too carefully at what's going on here. And the question is why after mortality in men over 50, why after it being constant for so long did it suddenly shoot up? The answer is due to an artifact, it's nothing to worry about. It's just that in the mid-1980s, the United States, um, there's, a, there's a group that deal with all the death certificates and the coding of death certificates, they introduced a computer program to select the underlying cause of death automatically from death certificates. It was done before by hand by very skilled coders. And they called the system, for better words, we should have called it Roadrunner, but it was actually called the ACME system. And when you look at the United Kingdom, what happened as soon as the, well, because it was in English, the UK could introduce it, there was a huge increase in prostate cancer mortality in men over the age of 70. And when you break that down, the big increases in the, <coughs> the over 85s, 80s to 84, 75 to 79. And what was happening was this program wouldn't accept a soft cause of death in the first part of the certificate, but found one that would go looking for a hard cause of death in a second. As soon as they introduced this in Britain, there was a 25% fall in the mortality from pneumonia. Because they started looking, oh, this person died of pneumonia, so they looked down and said, ah, yes, but you know, he had prostate cancer 20 years ago, so prostate cancer, even though it had nothing to do with the underlying cause of death, prostate cancer was selected out by this rather stupid computer program. It's now beginning to rectify itself but it produced this big artifact of increases. So every increase or decrease that you see is not necessarily, not necessarily real. One of the big, big questions today and where we need community action to do something about this. <coughs> there are four randomized trials going on of screening. We need randomized trials because we need to know the benefits and we need to know any disadvantage and we need to see what the effective cost, the, not the cost benefit, but the advantage to the downside of these programs are. There's two studies which have been published, they're both of poor quality, and they show absolutely, absolutely no decline in mortality whatsoever due to screening. These are pretty rubbish trials, but they exist. There are two good trials out there. There's the PLCO, the Prostate Lung Polarectal Variant Trial, started in 1993. It recruited 37,000 men between 55 and 74, and the same number into a parallel control group. This study's been going on since 1993, and we don't have the results yet. This is in the United States. In, the United, in Europe, there's a European randomized study, ERSPC, started in 1991. It's got 84,000 men and 99,000 in a control group. Again, it hasn't published the results. The results are taking a bit longer to go on because of some of the control group actually went and got screened. And they're waiting for st sufficient statistical power. They're taking much longer to finish than expected. However, if today we put together those two trials, we pull those data, we would have more than adequate statistical power to answer what, are the, what is the advantage and disadvantage of screening for prostate cancer and to make strong recommendations to the populations around the world. And it pains me that the egos of the scientists involved in the scientific community and the scientific groups involved is getting in the way of allowing us to have this important public health measure. And while we're waiting for the results, the message isn't going out to men what they should do, and it's unfortunate that people are going to die because of this particular situation. One of the great studies which is going on is a study that I'm helping out on. 
as shown by a man, Professor George Bartsch in Innsbruck. Austria is divided into nine, Austria is one country with nine federal states, one of which is the Tyrol. They've been very active in um, increasing their sparing radical prostatectomy. They began unorganised cancer detection in 1990. But from 1993, PSA testing was made freely available by the health authorities to every man aged 45 to 75. It was made available free, you can have it every year. And the thing is that after that test, you had direct access to high quality, free therapy, whatever you needed. In the first year they did this study, about a third of the population in that age group were um, screened. Up until 2005, there's been 107,000 people who have passed through that interval and 86.6% of men since 1993 have been between the age of 45 and 75 have had their PSA measured at least once. 15,000 had it measured 30, 14 times. There's many more, thousands, tens of thousands had it measured 13 and 12 times. It's become a routine part of what's going on there. The same wasn't introduced to the other federal states in Austria. So we can do this comparison between the mortality from prostate cancer in the Tyrol here compared to the rest of Austria. The rest of Austria, Austria is a very advanced, rich country with tremendous uh, healthcare system. And the evolution of prostate screening has been ad hoc, but it's been evolving in the same way it's been evolving in many other countries. It's just that it hasn't been so widely prevalent in the community as it has in the town. And here you can see the results in terms of the huge reduction and the more rapid reduction of mortality from prostate cancer in Tyrol, where there was screening compared to the rest of Austria, where there was no organised programme. These are just different mathematical ways of looking at the same thing. And here when you start fitting lines with the joint point, you can see very clearly this huge reduction in mortality. Accompanied by that is a very, very, very good safety profile of the, the surgery which has been formed. No 30-day mortality. Rectal injury now since 2000 has fallen to 0.1%. And no ureteral injuries, very little bleeding. Continence rate very, very high. And the potency rate post doctor is very, very high. So it's a very good, it's a very expert, high level, high quality group of urologists, radiologists, medical oncologists, everyone involved in the multidisciplinary treatment of prostate cancer death. You don't need to remember all these numbers. This just says that in 2005 in the Tyrol, based on the age specific rates from 1986 to 1990, before screening started, applied to the population of 2005, we expected 65 cases, 65 deaths from prostate cancer. In actual fact, there was only 30. We presented 35 deaths from prostate cancer, which was a 55% reduction over what was expected. That's really a very key and a very important result. It's not a randomized trial, but it gives you a very, very strong sense the organized screening in populations where there's a high uptake, where there's outstanding therapy with low adverse event rate, can lead to significant reductions in this very aggressive disease. The, problem, the other issue is that these were the men up to the age of 79 who say, well, okay, are we just postponing deaths? I, mean, I forgot something. When we look at the rest of Austria, there was um, 730 cases and um, deaths expected were 517, and this was a 30% reduction. So this is what's happening in high resource countries, about 30% reduction, and we got 55% reduction in the total. And this was the age 45 to 79. Now the question is, are we just postponing deaths till after the age of 80? And when we look at the deaths over the age of 80, we expected 50 in the total, we observed 32 in 2005, which is a 36% reduction, and whereas we only had a 7% reduction in the rest of Austria. So it's not, we're not postponing deaths, we're avoiding these deaths.
debts. We're avoiding significant fractions of the debts from prostate cancer. I love this. This is just a little aside from the Journal of Urology this year from Ian Thompson and his group. Um, it has been reported that men diagnosed with prostate cancer live longer, as long or longer than those without a diagnosis. And that's a really cute thing to see because they followed that up. Why is this? They looked at the VA hospital records in San Antonio in a consecutive series of patients. Discovered that 72% of men following surgery, 72% of men had a change of medical regime, 61% had a change of medication, and 29% received a new and significant medical diagnosis. So men who really don't like going to see the doctor do everything to avoid it. Once they're, once they're into the system, they have a significant change in their health. They've got an advantage here to treat for the prostate cancer, but their life expectancy improves also because of changes that have other diseases, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, or whatever, and to go and treat those. That is really a nice, nice side spin off of, um, of the whole prostate area at the present time. So why are we here? We're here because there's a global epidemic of cancer. We're here because there's a huge epidemic of prostate cancer just now. One which is going to get worse as we go forward. One which we know and we're fairly certain we can do something about in reducing the mortality. But we're waiting for a few more pieces of information to come along. We really can't wait forever. When you're faced with a situation like this, uh, in 2005, a man in the United States has got a 17% chance of having a diagnosis of prostate cancer in his lifetime. He's got a 3% risk of dying from prostate cancer. We've really got to do something. We really just can't sit around and say, well, okay, we'll have this academic exercise finished in a couple of years and then we'll see what to do. It's gone past that. And that's the advantage of this mission that Aaron set up and, and all his colleagues and friends in the business community, the medical community here. It really is time, it really is beyond time to do something about the problem with prostate cancer. Thank you very much. For your time.